<clears throat> this afternoon we'll um, be beginning the <clears throat> times for the group in interviews, conversations. If you're terrified of interviews, <laughs> just think of it as a opportunity for a, a chat, a conversation. Um, but I uh, thought also it might be useful if there were uh, any general questions that people like uh, might like to ask this morning, just to have a, a few minutes now of uh, any particular things that uh, people would like to ask or could use some clarifying. But, uh, so please, uh, anyone has any doubts, questions? Yes. Um, it's a bit theoretical, maybe, but it's um, to do with the Patricia Samopada. I always thought that the um, point where you um, could deserve the train mm -hmm. would be between Tanha and Upadana. Uh, but it was the clinging, the grasping, that was a crucial thing. You can't help desire. Uh, well, uh, different people have different experiences, but um, uh, when uh, we speak about Vedana, of that feeling, um, that, uh, that's including uh, liking and disliking, so that liking something is not the same as desiring something. And that's a, I feel, feel that's a very useful distinction to make. Uh, of course, the, there's there's a, a blurry line between craving and clinging, <laughs> and uh, there, there's a lot of, of overlap there. And um, in uh, in many of the Buddha's teachings, he uses the words fairly interchangeably. Uh, but uh, I'd say that this, that's the I feel the most important distinction to make and to clarify is that uh, we can like something without having to chase after it. Just just this morning, um, I was uh, chatting with, with the other monastics and uh, was recounting a story Ajahn Chah used to tell from time to time. It's somewhere in the commentaries. You can't find it in the Pali Canon itself, because I've looked. <laughs> it's somewhere in the commentaries. And it recounts this incident where the, the Buddha has been invited to have a, a meal at the... the um, the palace of uh, the um, uh, King Pasenadi and Queen Malika, I think. And they have this great banquet um, offered to them, and Venerable Ananda makes a comment of uh, saying, oh, uh, isn't, it, isn't it wonderful, isn't it marvelous how even though there's this uh, magnificent spread of, of food, all these delicious flavors and aromas here, um, you know, the, the Tathagata is completely uh, unmoved is, and is indifferent to all the different... Uh, you know, flavors of the, the food that are offered as if there was um, you know, and nothing um, uh, you know, as if they were all a single flavor that's the implication the kind of um, uh, see, uh, impression or understanding that Ananda has that you know that the, the Buddha would would be um, completely um, so, uh, so, uh, indifferent or, or wouldn't even notice the various flavors that are the, uh, of the foods that was offered, and the Buddha said, as he usually does, "Not so, Ananda. <laughs> not so. You know, it is not the case that the Tathagata uh, for all for the Tathagata all tastes are, are neutral or or uh, um, uh, of an equal nature. In fact, the, one of the characteristics of the Tathagata is that his sense of taste is extremely acute." And then, um, according to the story, he then took some food out of his bowl and said, Here, Ananda, eat this, and you will taste things. You'll taste the food as the Tathagata tastes it. So Ananda puts this food in his mouth, and there's this explosion of incredible sort of taste experience. And Ananda sort of knocked off his cushion. And uh, he said, oh, It's wonderful, it's marvelous, it's incredible, you know, that the, the Tathagata has this. Uh, uh, this experience of taste, and the Buddha says, and yes, and not only when there's this rich and fine food that is offered, but even in you know, ordinary food, just even the, the taste of, of ordinary rice, the Tathagata is the, um, is supremely rich and uh, and delicious. And uh, <clears throat> so the the, the, the Buddha is saying that yeah, the 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 um, 
sense of taste is extremely acute. It's really enjoyable as a powerful and, and delightful experience, but the mind is not so disturbed or upset or, or confused by that. So um, uh, that, I feel, is a very uh, important, helpful distinction to make. That, uh, uh, and we, if we can see that there's uh, a capacity to like something without desiring it, or to dislike something without resenting it or wanting to get away from it, then there's a, a tremendous freedom there. Uh, many years ago, when Ajahn Sumedho was a young monk uh, at uh, Wat Ajahn Chah's monastery at Wat Bapong, um, it was a very austere life, and Wat Bapong is a very um, kind of barren environment. I mean, there's lots of trees, <laughs> but it's extraordinarily plain and simple and austere living conditions. Ajahn Chah was uh, very proud of the fact they had the worst food in the world. <laughs> uh, you know, and I lived at Wat Bapong, so I know it's. Uh, I can, I can uh, affirm that <laughs> assessment. So one day the, there's a, a, a visit from the local nursing college. A group of student nurses came with their teachers from the Ubon Nursing College. And so uh, normally as a, as a junior monastic, you know, you're kept you know, well away from any kind of visitors. And so on this particular occasion, though Ajahn Chah had invited the young Ajahn Sumedho to come and sit with him because he was a only foreign monk in the province and is a kind of rare species, and uh, also that people would be very inspired by the presence of a foreigner coming to live in Ubon, and very interesting to, for them to meet a foreign monk, which was kind of unheard of in that, that region before. So uh, there was uh, the young Sumedho Bhikkhu sitting with Ajahn Chah, he's talking with the, the, uh, the, the student nurses and their, their teachers for a couple of hours. And so this is a very unusual situation for a, for a trainee monk to be in, where you, where you have um, sort of 30 or 40, 50 young women very close by, because you know, normally you would be uh, uh, keeping a, a great distance. And so anyway, at the end of that, that uh, period, uh, Ajahn uh, and the, the, the nurses uh, and their teachers had, had all left. Then Ajahn Chah uh, turned to Ajahn Sumato and said, So Sumato, what did that do to your mind? <laughs> the, in, and particularly, I should mention, in Northeast Thailand, they're very straightforward about matters of sex and death and and uh, kind of body functions and uh, you know, the raw raw uh, aspects of and, uh, of life are not uh, are not things that are, are not spoken about. And so he just said, "So, Sumedho, what did that do to your mind?" <clears throat> and uh, the comment that he he made in, in Thai, he said, "Chop." Dare my owl, which means I like, but I don't want. And so uh, Lumpur Chah was so impressed with that, he thought, very good, Sumato, <laughs> that apparently for the next two or three weeks that was the theme for every Dharma talk that he gave <laughs> because of recognizing yeah, this is a crucial distinction to make. That he wasn't saying, um, yeah, I was just trying to kind of hold myself down and uh, stop myself from, from um, getting carried away with desire. He wasn't um, like generating aversion in his mind uh, or uh, feeling fear. It's just recognizing, yeah, there's just the way that hormones work. Here I am, a, you know, a young, a young male, and here's you know, a large number of young young females, and uh, that's the chemistry works. You know, there is there is uh, there's chemistry happening, but I don't have to be confused by that. I don't have to follow it. I don't have to be afraid of it. I don't have to. Um, Say, put and make anything out of it. So uh, I feel that's a very uh, uh, important deci uh, distinction to make, and to to not be afraid of of liking or disliking. You know, when you're feeling pain, you have a you have a, a um, like a, say you're, you're feeling uh, oppressed by the heat. Or like I was mentioning, uh, the monk I was with in Tibet, you know, having a migraine for two weeks. And uh, you know, you say, well, "How's the head today?" And you say, "Pretty bad." <laughs> <laughs> so he could uh, very impressively just be with a feeling of disliking, it was, uh, but not uh, not resenting it, not pushing it away, not not contending against it. John, I've been uh, trying to sort of contemplate feeling and all these things, and mainly 
both with the heat and this big pain in my knees. They're quite sort of strong feeling. And sometimes I can just be aware of it as an unpleasant feeling. It is unpleasant. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. I know I don't like it. But the quality of mind can be really peaceful. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes the complaining <laughs> from that sort of contemplation. So, I mean, I'm glad that Ursula asked that question because it was very much in my mind as well, where you actually get on the train. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes you can just really listen to the mind not wanting it and just going over it. But you don't quite get carried away by the train mm -hmm. because you're actually trying to stay aware. Yes, well, well yeah, and I'd say that you you can be at peace with the complaining too, because uh, taking a, a step back from that, just to, uh, uh, in a sense, give it give it some give it some room to say oh, this is the this is the sound of the complaining mind, and um, uh, because uh, you don't have to believe in the content of it, you don't have to be re rejecting it, you don't have to be convincing yourself of something other. You can simply be aware. Oh, this is what the complaining mind sounds like, and and sometimes it can help to to clarify that to do some conscious complaining. Yeah, and uh, or and there's a, a whole little practice you can do um, around this, and so when you find your mind murmuring like that, why don't they put on the fans? <laughs> and then you you notice that that uh, movement in the, in the mind. So then you catch that, and then just just repeat it in a, a clear and steady way. Yeah. Why don't they put on the fans? And just hearing the the, the complaint, just the, uh, you know, in a, in a sense, highlighting it, um, and then then also carrying it through the implications. If they put the fans on, I would be happy. I'd never ask for anything else ever again. Yeah. And it doesn't take much to, to just uh, to follow through the implications of, of, if only I didn't have this cough, everything would be all right. And, uh, and, and usually if you do that, you can't get to the end of the sentence before the whole thing collapses. You know, it loses its strength and you, you, you sort of bring it into full, uh, clear, clear vision. And uh, you realize, well, yes, if the, they put the fans on, there'll be a moment of, ah, this is great. And then ten seconds later, I wish I didn't have this cough. <laughs> I wish the other person didn't have their cough. <laughs> and the, the mind finds something else to, to get engaged with. And so that's why uh, I, I say just to regard the, yeah, the the desire mind is a liar. It it makes these promises. If only I had it like if only I just had this, just this, I would be fine. And I, I've often told the story how uh, when I was about four years old, I uh, in I lived in a little village uh, near a village in in Kent, and uh, um, there was a toy shop in the village. And I fell in love with this little mauve bubble car, like a matchbox car. If those of you remember little three-wheeler cars with the door on the front? Back in the 50s and 60s. So the little mauve bubble car in the shop window, and I fell madly in love with this. I was about four. And uh, I came from a very poor family, so we had a standard of, you only got presents on birthdays and Christmas, no other time. So I was begging my mother to get me this little mauve bubble car. And I remember saying, please, 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 if I could just have that little mauve bubble car, I'd never want anything else ever again. 
And I remember feeling that was absolutely true. That, uh, promising this. Yeah, I, I promise, I promise her. I'd never ask for anything. I'd never want anything else ever again. Promise. And I was convinced of that in my little four-year-old psyche. And then um, one day we, uh, we went into the village and I looked in the shop window and the bubble car was gone. <gasps> Devastation. And I didn't, notice, didn't notice this kind of sly grin on my mother's face. But uh, uh, I, was, I was devastated. Oh, the, the bubble car had gone. And I didn't put two and two together that my birthday was coming in a couple of weeks. But anyway, um, finally my birthday came around and ta-da! Unwrapped this little package and there was the little mauve bubble car. And so, perfect happiness for a day. <laughs> and then, yeah, as you can predict, you know, after a day or two, I'm, I'm playing with it less and less. And then after a, a, a week or so, I say, Mom, can I have something or other? She said, you said that if you got that little mauve bubble car, you'd never want anything ever again. I said, wow, yeah, this is different. Yeah. And, I, and yeah, I can still remember thinking, oh, I was so sure. And then my mind, the, the inner lawyer trying to come up with a case why you know, I really did need this other thing. But anyway, that little Mo bubble car became a kind of family icon. So even when I left home and went off to, to, um, to Asia and became a monk, my mother still kept it. <laughs> As a kind of reminder. So it's this sort of icon of desire, this little Mo bubble. It, uh, we can be so convinced that we... Uh, we're never going to need or want anything ever again. When the mind fixates on, if I could just have, you know, that that thing, if they could just put the fans on, if they could just turn the fans off. When I was living in a Bayagiri monastery in California, it's much hotter than here, so eighty degrees would be a cool day. Seriously, the temperatures there could. Uh, and get up to get up to um i think the the hottest i ever knew it was 123 so 50 degrees centigrade 123 fahrenheit yes you know, full grown trees would would die in that kind of heat so 80 is kind of balmy <laughs> but i always liked to have the fans on and ajahn pasano didn't like to have the fans on because the sound would, would be, he was very sensitive to sound whereas for me it would, I was I would enjoy the cool breezes and the sound didn't affect me at all the sound was very uh, very irritating and bothersome to him so uh, since he was senior <laughs> I would happily defer to him and, but uh, we have a completely opposite experience like the, when the, when the, if the fans were going, he'd be thinking, oh, "Why can't they turn the fans off? Don't they know?" And I'm and I'm thinking, "Ah, oh, bless." So that we are in in this also, you're rec you're recognizing the fickle nature of desire and how when you get that kind of complaining or judgment going on in the mind, to recognize you know this is this is very dependent, it's conditional. And that even though it seems convincing that if I just could have this or just stop that, then. <laughs> just to say, uh, and this is again a very simple practice of Ajahn Chah's, he'd say, turn to it and say, liar. <laughs> You're a liar. <laughs> it's not true. And, uh, and uh, you know, that, um, that simple recognition, oh, this is just a, a statement of the mind, this is just a, a random judgment. It doesn't have to be believed in, it doesn't have to be bought into. And then, without suppressing it, without fearing it, you can you know, hear the complaining, and they are, and you can actually have compassion for it. Oh, it's the my beloved complaining mind. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> and that you can relate to that just as a, an ordinary, natural, uh, reactive process of the mind. And here it is. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to push it away. You don't have to suppress it. It's just what the thinking mind does. Yes. Um, I find that um, Dukkha and Nietzsche are very easy to grasp, and Anatta is much more difficult. And it has been happening for the last how long I've been coming here, there's no deal. So, uh, what I find is if I'm trying to think my way out of being an individual and self, 
question um, in a way that then there needs to be uh, in order to see that uh, all things are not self there has to be a complete uh, acceptance of what you think of as yourself and just being able to in particular I, I find um, the In a way that welcoming in uh, and uh, and clearly knowing that, that those feelings of I and me and mine. Uh, so one of the the things that we that that is is that we miss or we don't see clearly is that the feeling of I ness and me ness is a feeling. It's like just like the weight of your body on the on the chair or the sensation of your your, your glasses on on your nose. The feeling of the, the the temperature of the air, there's just like there's a physical sensations, um, or the um, <coughs> uh, meant the, the when you remember something pleasant or you remember something um, uh, say um, poignant. That there's a, a tone, there's a a, 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 a a like a texture that goes with those memories or those ideas, those sensations. The feeling of I. And mine, I and me, uh, is also just a, a, a texture. It's just a, a, um, a particular pattern of feeling. And uh, if we can receive that uh, and know that in, a, in, a, in an unbiased and open way, if, like, in a way that's what metta is, that sort of unbiased openness to experience and, and of receiving things, knowing things as they are, uh, then there can be a way that, that that feeling of I, me, mine, can be, uh, uh, say, acknowledged and, and apprehended without there, in a way, in a way, without believing the content of it. You see what I mean? So that that, that the feeling of I ness, uh, ahankara, I amness in Pali, mamankara, mindness. Um, just to be able to know that as a feeling, just like you you can feel the weight of your body, or you can you feel the sweetness of a memory, or a, or the sadness of a of a certain memory, then that tone, there can there's a tone that goes along with that feeling of I. So in meditation, one of the most simple and direct kinds of reflection on this is just to to bring up the word I. Or or mine. This is mine. No other, no other text. <laughs> just that, uh, just that, I feeling. Oh, this is mine. My experience, my mind. This is mine. And uh, when, when there's sufficient openness and clarity there, you, that uh, that quality of of ahankara, mamankara, iness, and mindness, meanness, that can be. Uh, Recognizes just as an arising uh, uh, m- a mood or a, a, a texture, just as a memory or a thought or a feeling, and and it, it takes uh, a lot to not be drawn into the the, the kind of um, the identification with that, but just to know it as a feeling, and in a sense that's what that that attitude of loving kindness or metta is that. Uh, Total openness of receiving things as they are, without adding anything to them, without getting caught up in them. Don't know if that that helps, but also just just to you bring up the 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 words like I am or me, 
And when the mind is sufficiently calm and spacious, when you say the word me or I, it feels very, very weird. Or even a, a more effective can be your own name. So just without, again, without any other text, just when your mind is quiet and still, just to bring up the word Judith. Judith. And then notice, you know, even as, as I say that, you're probably, you're probably recognizing, that is pretty weird. <laughs> right? That weirdness is the, that's the, ins, that's the doorway to anatta. That, ooh. Because it's so, it's so, uh, so much of a kind of uh, everyday reality. It's just so normal. We, we refer to this with this name. But when we isolate that, go and bring it into full consciousness, say, Judith, Amaro. That in the heart, which says, what the heck is that? <laughs> that, in a sense, is that quality of, uh, of wisdom is, is, in a sense, that which is knowing the, the um, habitual patterns of identification and is not in that moment caught into it. So it's recognized, oh, I'm not that. That's that's not who and what I am. Ah. So there's this kind of vertigo almost. Ooh. So even though that might be unsettling, it's unsettling to the ego, but it's liberating to your heart. So I I, and I, I recommend that as a kind of very simple, straightforward practice, just to meditate on your own name. And then that feeling of, what the heck's that got to do with anything real? <laughs> Just to to let the, let the attention stay with that un uh, unformed, groundless feeling, that quality of ooh. Uh, it's difficult to stay with, but to to stay with that that kind of openness, then that's a it's a, a doorway to that that insight. Okay, one last one, yeah. Yeah. Could you please explain again how the Shikhan plays the Pachaka in the name of the text, not in the Well, Pachaya it literally means conditions or, or affects, like so that uh, ignorance affects um, uh, the formations, or the formations affect mind and body. So it doesn't create them. So like ignorance doesn't create the formations, or it's, uh, but it's a broad term. So pachaya means it conditions or has some kind of relationship to it. It affects it in in one of many different ways. Yeah, as I said, there's twenty. The 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 books list twenty four different ways that the those kind of conditional relations work. But it's uh, uh, it's a um, it's it's good to explore that to take a, a, an individual link and say okay well how does uh, sense contact condition feeling or how does um, the mind and body condition the six senses how how, how does that uh, how is that link working what what in what ways do they affect each other so I'm currently being affected by this clock. Which says eleven twenty-eight. So I think it's time to close this um, discussion, and then we'll move on to the next phase of the day.